who is here to attend the clinical grand rounds and the topic is super selective IC for retinoblastoma. We will be presenting a multidisciplinary perspective and uh, the departments that are involved are Unit 6, Department of Ophthalmology, RP Center, Professor Radhika Tandon is the unit in charge, ma'am is here and uh, we are joined in by Department of Neuroradiology and Department of Pediatrics. Uh, welcome to Professor Gaikwad, Professor Rashna and their teams. So uh, basically uh, we will be talking about IAC over the next few minutes and we will be uh, presenting pers a perspective from the ophthalmology, interventional neuroradiology and ped pediatrics viewpoint. So for the first uh, presentation, I would uh, like to invite our senior resident, Dr. Soumya, to come and give a brief overview of IAC and the clinical indications. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about introduction to IC, that is intraarterial chemotherapy for retinoblastoma. So what is retinoblastoma? It's a primary malignant neoplasm of the retina that is arising from the immature retinal cells. It's a most common primary intraocular malignancy of childhood in all racial groups. So the most common presenting feature is leukoporia, followed could be other symptoms could be discharge, pain, squint, redness, poor vision, inflammation, anisocoria or proptosis. So as we can see here, these are the clinical presentations. It could be leukoporia or any kind of preceptal orbital cellulitis or pain and inflammation. The incidence of retinoblastoma is approximately 1 in 15,000 to 20,000 live births. So it could be unifocal or multifocal. 70% are unilateral, by 30% are bilateral. 94% are sporadic, whereas 6% are familiar. It could be hereditary in 40 to 50% and non hereditary in 50 to 60% of the cases. Coming to genetics, we know the RB1 gene, that is uh, chromosome number 13P14, uh, is responsible. Mutation of this gene in two forms. If it's a germinal retinoblastoma, the first it happens in germ cell, followed by the second hit in retina, uh, retinal cell, results in bilateral multifocal retinoblastoma. If it's a normal non germline RB, the first and second it happens in ret retinal cell itself, results in unilateral cases. If it's RB1 gene mutation syndrome, in which there is dysmorphic features, retinal delays, and retinoblastoma. How common is this retinoblastoma? So a patient with retinoblastoma with a positive family history is 40% risk in siblings and offspring and with no family history has, uh, in, if it's a unilateral case, 1% risk in siblings, 8% risk in offspring and in bilateral retinoblastoma, 6% risk at siblings and 40% in offspring. The classification for intraocular retinoblastoma was given by Murphy in 2005. So this is most commonly used for grouping of the case of the eyes with retinoblastoma. Group A, as we can see in this picture, small intraretinal tumors away from the foveal and disc, all tumors which are 3 mm or smaller in greater dimension, confined to the retina. All tumors which are located more than 3 mm from fovea and 1.5 mm from optic disc. The second is group B, all discrete tumors which are confined to retina. These are tumors slightly bigger than group A, they do not fit to group A, but they are confined to retina. And also they can be associated with subretinal fluid less than 3 mm from the tumor with no subretinal sealing as in this picture. It could be unifocal or multifocal as seen in this picture. Group C, discrete local disease with minimal subretinal or vitreous sealing. The tumors are discrete and here it does, there could be subretinal fluid without seeding involving up to one fourth of the retina. There could be local vitreous seeding around the tumor which is discrete tumor present and there could be local separated seeding within 3 mm that is 2 disdiapters from the tumor. Group D is diffuse disease with significant vitreous or separated seeding. Tumors may be massive or diffuse. There could be separated seeding without, without seeding present. And the, these seeds which can be diffuse or it can be massive as in this picture. They could be greasy seeds or avascular tumor masses. And these diffuse, sub, the seeds can go subretinal as well resulting in plaque and tumor nodded formation. Group E is the last group. There's a sprints of one or more of these four prognostic features. There could be a tumor touching the lens as seen in this ultra biomicroscopy picture. Tumor in anterior to vitreous face, ciliary body or anterior segment. There's a pseudo hypopion with seeds present in the anterior segment. Diffuse infiltrating retinoblastoma. The entire retina is involved, whole globe is involved. New vascular glaucoma, opaque media with vitreous image as explained in the ultrasonic photography. And there could be tumor necrosis or aerosceptical orbital cellulitis or thysis bulbi as explained. So, when a child of retinoblastoma comes to us, what is the basic evaluation we do? The basic clinical examination, visual acuity is done according to age of the child by cardiff Tellers, Nellens, visual acuity charting. 
anti-segment and fantasy evaluation and gross examination to see if there is an orbital muscle prognosis. Followed by an ocular ultrasound, a B mode by A, B by A scan is done in booty eyes. So, we see moderate to high amplitude spikes of intraocular mass with calcification as in this year. This is an A vector which is showing Foucault calcification. By ultrasound alone is inconclusive to tell that it's retinoblastoma. So it's important to do a magnetic resonance imaging MRI of these pictures. Contrastinence fat suppress MRI, brain in orbit, axial sagittal and coronal sections with 2 mm cuts through optic nerve and pillar band. So in T1 weighted images it is hyper intense to the vitreous and in T2 images it is hypo intense and contrast enhanced imaging is very important to see if there is optic nerve enhancement. Then followed by the main thing, the examination under anesthesia, which is done in the OT, the first staging of the tumor, anti-segment evaluation in the microscope, the fundus examination including indentation fundoscopy for examination of the periphery. And a clinical picture using red cam, it gives a complete 130 degree view of the retina to locate the tumors and for grouping. This is the red cam which we use in our OTs. So coming to the globe salvage modalities for treatment of retinoblastoma can be divided into chemotherapy, focal or radiation. Chemotherapy can be intravenous where we use a vincristinate deposited carboplatin regimen or it could be intraarterial chemotherapy, IEC that is what we are talking about today, intravitreal injections or periocular injections of anti-cancer drugs. Focal includes TTT that is transpupillary uh, thermotherapy and cryotherapy and under radiation we have plaque brachytherapy and EPRD which is external new radiotherapy. So what is IAC? It is a targeted therapy in which the chemotherapeutic drug is injected directly into the ophthalmic artery of the involved eye under radiological guidance. The process of IAC, this is the history as it goes. It was first introduced in 1954 by Algernon Rees, where direct internal carotid artery was injected with alkylating agent triethylene methamine. Followed by 2004, with Suzuki and Keneko et al. in Japan, they came up with selective IAC, where a microbilling catheter to white transfemoral root was inflated distal to the ophthalmic artery orifice and the drug was injected. Later came as a super selective IAC by Abramson and Gobin in the US in 2006, where the direct ophthalmic artery intra arterial inflation of the drug was done. The indications for IAC include refractory retinoblastoma, recurrent tumor with or without subretinal seeds, and primary, or these are come, these two come under secondary IACs. Primary IAC, that's the first treatment which is done, it could be done in group C or group D. Contraindications for intraarterial chemotherapy include eyes with vitreous hemorrhage, preceptal or orbital cellitis, pre thysical or thysical life, new vascular glaucoma, extraocular retinoblastoma, that is optic nerve or scleral extension, trilateral retinoblastoma with involvement of pineal gland, any kind of systemic metastasis. And if there is tortuous ophthalmic artery failure to catheterize the artery. So the types of IAC can be explained under primary IAC, where IAC itself is used as a first line of treatment for the tumor. Secondary IAC is there's a failed previous treatment. Any modality of treatment, whether it is systemic chemotherapy or any external radiotherapy being given, and it is failed. And that's why we are giving IAC as a treatment. Tandem IAC is why bilateral simultaneous administrative IAC done in both the eyes. Bridge IAC is when treatment of retinoblastoma is initially insisted with chemotherapy or intravitreal, followed later by IAC for bridging the gap. Finally comes is rescue IAC, that is initial IAC has been given, but there is some, some of the recurrence or rescue reduces for which rescue IAC is done for the seeds. The drugs use three main drugs, melphalan, topotecan and carboplatin. So uh, melphalan mainly used, this is a, in, we have three regimens, single drug, double drug and triple drug regimens. So in single we start with melphalan double has a combination of melphalan and topotecan and with triple drug or three drugs are used. So melphalan is mainly used in group B and group C RBs. If it's advanced then we use for double drug and if there is any recurrence and subroptimal response to previous IC, all three drugs are used. So a child who comes with a retinoblastoma plant for IAC, this is a protocol we followed. The patient is admitted in the ward for the procedure. Investigations like complete hemogram, liver function test, kidney function test, PTINR, chest x ECG is done. A PHU at RPC bed with ventilator is arranged after informing the pediatrician on call. The patient is then shifted to neuroradiology. A pre-anesthetic evaluation is done and the procedure is carried out in the neuroradiology department. The patient is then shifted back to PHU for post-procedure monitoring and then the uh, patient is uh, shifted back to the ward and discharged the next day. Thank you. Then uh, now Dr. Sabidhachi will be talking about the IAC procedure from Hindu. Thank you, Dr. Swami. Uh, <coughs> uh, once the patient is shifted to the neuroradiology department, the patient is usually uh, pre-scheduled and it comes to us uh, at 8 a.m. in the morning. A uh, rigorous history taking session is uh, done and patient's attendants are asked to sign the consent after they explained the, all the complications of the procedure, all the potential complications of the procedure. 
Once we have the consent, patient is uh, shifted for a pre-chemotherapy CT scan. This CT scan forms a baseline for uh, comparing any complications uh, after the procedure. This uh, CT scan is uh, done under uh, general anesthesia if the patient is uncooperative. Meanwhile, uh, we plan the case as to which I and number of drugs and the number of sessions that the patient had and has to be done. After everything is ready, uh, patient is uh, taken on into our cat lab. Patient is uh, intubated and general anesthesia is again a very tricky business in such young patients. Once patient is into our cat lab and uh, patient has been intubated, uh, femoral axis is taken into this, in, into this pediatric patient and we use a 4 French vascular sheet for any patient who is under 2.5 kgs and a 5 French vascular sheet for everyone who is more than 2.5 kgs. To notice that in such uh, pediatric cases, uh, the axis is so tricky that we use an ultrasound guidance and we use a uh, cotton pad under the buttocks of the patient to extend the legs. Once we have achieved our femoral axis, a uh, bolus of intra-arterial uh, unfractionated heparin is given in, in the 50 units per kg dose. And similarly, 20 units per kg is put into the infusion tip that is connected to our guide catheters, which is uh, to prevent uh, embolic complications in our guide catheters. Once everything is ready, our guide catheters are uh, ready and put into the lab the required uh, car carotid artery and we usually, dis usually use a distal access catheter for the shame. It has a distal supple end so that it is easily navigated into the tortuous uh, anatomy of the pediatric patient. Once we are done with the procedure, we achieve a febrile artery hemostasis using a compression bandage for 30 minutes and uh, thereafter patient is uh, sent to the ward and after a post chemotherapy CT basically to compare our complications if we have done any. Once uh, in the post procedure notes, uh, we document that our CBC is required for the patient uh, at least a week after the procedure because the melphalan, one of the drugs that Dr. Swami discussed, is immunosuppressive. Contraindications to IAC have previously been discussed, but uh, any kind of extension outside the globe and a systemic metastasis is a contraindication. Fortunately, we have not uh, had significant side effects, but to mention, neutropenia is one of the commonest systemic side effects, and uh, amongst those around the globe, we have periocular edema, dosis, uh, and poor erythema. Let's start with case examples. The first case uh, that, uh, that we are going to discuss is uh, a patient which had, which had three chemotherapy sessions under us and had a recalcitrant group D uh, retinoblastoma in the left eye and which reduced its, uh, his visual acuity. This was the first uh, pre-MOCT that the patient had in January 23 and had a calcified lesion on the medial aspect of the left globe. As discussed previously, we used a guide catheter to cannulate the left uh, common carotid artery and the run showed that uh, there is a prominent ophthalmic artery which might be supplying uh, the globe. Next, we take a guide catheter up uh, superiorly and uh, we selectively hook the IC and take an angiogram run. This shows the prominent ophthalmic artery that will be later used for chemotherapy. Uh, the ophthalmic artery usually starts uh, uh, below the optic nerve, goes laterally, binds around the optic nerve as an optic strut and gives the further branches. To note is that the, this optic strut gives us the central retinal artery which is our target for embolization. Uh, once we are uh, satisfied that the ophth ophthalmic artery has to be hooked, uh, we use a microwire which is a 0 0.08 inches microwire, commonly a mirage or a hybrid to access the artery and then our microcatheter, usually a marathon, is slided over this microwire and we go into the ophthalmic artery. A typical ophthalmic artery run is taken prior to delivering uh, the drugs and central retinal artery as we can see is our target. But there are other branches that the ophthalmic artery has and uh, some authors actually advocate uh, putting a prilocaine jelly over the forehead to reduce the two cause uh, constriction of the, those other branches and have a better effect in the coil brush, although we don't use it. The drug details as uh, were discussed previously, the melphalan is the drug of choice and usually are used as a single agent for group B and C drugs and uh, the other ones are topotican and carboplatin. Melphalan usually comes as a powder which is uh, reconstituted in a sterile diluent and we use a 4 mg of melphalan for one uh, case. And melphalan dose uh, can be reduced if it is a tandem IAC when it is, and then it is combined with carboplatin. A typical topotican dose is 0.4 mg and the carboplatin is 30 mg. Or any, any amount of drugs are uh, totally diluted in a 30 ml uh, normal saline solution and given in a pulsatile manner over 30 minutes. After we have given our drugs, we take a check angiogram run to document any uh, thromboembolic complications if during the procedure. This patient had a second session of embo in March 2023 in which uh, similarly an IC run was taken and an ophthalmic artery run was taken. And the central, uh, central retinal artery is documented 
on the observing factor term. Again, a third sensitive patient had in June 2023, uh, again had a, a uh, an ophthalmic artery run was taken and provided the brush was documented. We had an excellent, excellent result with this uh, chemotherapy. It shows reduction in size of uh, the calcified region in the left optic, uh, in the left cloth. Another case uh, that came to us, another case of ophthalmic artery injection. It had the patient had two sessions with us in April and June 2023, and had a bilateral group D retinoblastoma, although we treated only the left side. This uh, patient had a calcified lesion on the middle aspect of the globe. In April 2023, for when the patient came for us for the first session in uh, April 2023. Again, as discussed previously, we dis uh, we cannulated the left IC, went into the ophthalmic artery using the microcatheter and wire, documented the choroidal brush and the central retinal artery too. Patient had an excellent result with our chemotherapy, documented significant reduction in size of the lesion over uh, three months follow-up that we had. When patient came to us in June 2023, we had uh, the second session of uh, embolize, uh, second session of chemotherapeutic drugs given to the patient, and we still have to have the patient for for. Them. To note is that ophthalmic artery is not the only artery that can be used for embolization, as many patients might not have a prominent ophthalmic artery, and in those cases, we can use the middle meningeal, the sphenopalatine, the distal internal maxillary artery for embolization, mainly because there are a number of PCIC anastomoses that can be used at our advantage. The lacrimal artery of ICA is uh, usually uh, anastomosis with the middle temporal and the middle meningeal. The supraorbital anastomosis with the frontal branch of uh, superficial temporal. The ethmoidals with spinopalatine and the nasal artery with the angular artery. If uh, we do not have even the ECA route for embolization, we can uh, use uh, documented balloon occlusion of ICA where we alternate balloon inflation with the rubber fusion and give our drug during the balloon inflation time. And we expect the drug to go into the globe. The balloon is usually uh, placed distal to the origin of the ophthalmic artery. This is a case which had a right side group D retinoblastoma and a left side group B retinoblastoma, both were regressing and had three sessions of embolization with us in February, May, and July. In any of the embolization, we could not document the ophthalmic artery from uh, the ophthalmic segment of the supraclinoid uh, IC. In one of, uh, I'm showing just one of the embo sessions where the EC run documented uh, the reformation of ophthalmic artery, which is shown by the red arrow uh, via the middle meningeal branch. In all these embo sessions, our distal middle meningeal run showed reformation of the uh, ophthalmic artery via the MMA, and drugs were given. An excellent response to chemotherapy was achieved over time, as can be shown on the right globe. Another case of retinoblastoma with which the left eye was inucleated and the right eye had a group D retinoblastoma, the visual activity was reduced. This patient had two sessions of uh, chemotherapy with us in June and August 23. Uh, in this patient, a calcified lesion was noted on the posterior lateral aspect of the right lobe, and uh, ICRN did not show any ophthalmic artery, and the left ECRN showed a prominent ophthalmic artery being reconstituted via the uh, middle meningeal branch. The MMA run was acquired, and it can be clearly seen through the red arrow that the ophthalmic artery was uh, can uh, was reconstructed. Drug was given slowly to prevent reflux into the IC. Another case: uh, this patient had a group B retinoblastoma in the right eye and a group E retinoblastoma in the left eye, and had two sessions with us in June and August 23. The first time, uh, the preambo CT the patient had uh, in the first time was a large uh, calcified lesion in the posterior aspect of the left lobe. The first time we were lucky to have an ophthalmic artery uh, for use for chemotherapy and the IC run shows the ophthalmic artery clearly while the ophthalmic artery run shows the central retinal artery which was used for embolite, uh, for chemotherapeutic drug delivery. Uh, over a period of uh, four months, uh, there, there was a reduction in size noted of the calcified lesion and a uh, patient came for us for the second session in July 23. This time we could not document any ophthalmic artery most likely because uh, of uh, Iatrogenic stenosis of the ophthalmic artery, which is very commonly documented. Then we had to go into the EC, and uh, we could not see any overt reconstru reconstruction or reconstitution of the ophthalmic artery from any of the ECA branches. So we had to actually go into each of those vessels and explore if there was uh, any reconstruction of the ophthalmic artery. We went into the middle meningeal artery, and we could not see any reconstruction of ophthalmic artery. Then we selected the distal internal maxillary artery for uh, uh, seeing any choroidal blush. To our advantage, and to our benefit, there was a superior anterior deep temporal, which all, not only had the tumor branches, but also recon, uh, reconstructed the ophthalmic artery on the left side. We gave our drugs into this artery, 
and uh, we still have to get a follow up for this patient. The another case, this patient had a bilateral group uh, E retinoblastoma, but was aggressive on the left side. This patient had three sessions with us in March, May, and July 23. Uh, this patient had an interesting uh, variant of uh, the ophthalmic artery, and it showed a recurrent meningeal uh, being uh, arising from the ophthalmic artery, but also this ophthalmic artery gave into the central retinal artery. We could not select, we cannot actually selectively cannulate the central retinal artery because of its small size. So we had to give our drugs from here and expect any resolution in the tumor. But as would be expected, there was no significant resolution, maybe because of this recurrent meningeal variant. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sir for discussing the technical challenges. So, next speaker is Professor Kaikwad, the key person who is behind the success of this program and uh, with a lot of expertise and skill and uh, so we are waiting to hear from him. So, as my resident already has highlighted some illustrative examples, so we do face some challenges also because the challenges could be because of the age of the patient. Most of them are less than five years old. Then general anesthesia is all procedures are done with general anesthesia. Because the procedure time is generally long, the risk of having failure is also there. Then because the child is small, the retinal artery is also small. So the pediatric vascular access generally is required here. And then there is a limitation of the contact. Radiation dose, there is a limitation. Procedure length we have to limit as short as possible. Sometimes in the neck we do have a which is a novel thing, a torturous vascular anatomy. And sometimes the ophthalmic artery may not be seen at all, may be difficult to navigate. And in the end, we have to uh, achieve the hemostasis. So, considering the age, most of them are under 5 years of age. And pediatric hemodynamics very different than the child from the other. And in general anesthesia, you need special devices, the laryngoscope should be small in size. Everything requires everything. If the procedure time is generally long, you know, the hypothermia is major. So, we generally we have about three ACs in our industry, which are two tons each. So, six tons is the requirement. So, what we do when we get these kids, we switch off the two ACs and only one AC is on. Sometimes the central AC is also switched off. Then we also have long clothing, so we heat up. And if the procedure time is less than 45 minutes in an hour, then generally we can avoid the hypothermia. For vascular access, yes, the pulsation of the artery is very important. If it's really pounding, it's easy to puncture. But when it's difficult, we always take ultrasound levels to puncture the artery. Then contrast dose is generally we take the uh, weight of the child. Maximum permissible dose is 3 ml per kg body weight in a concentration of 300 milligram IV per ml. So suppose the child is 3 and 3.5 3 kg, we maximum take 10 ml, divide that, but if you value that with 10 ml saline, so it becomes a 20 ml total volume. And this is the volume which we end up using. The other is the number of radiation dose, because if you limit the number of exposures, we have a biplane system, so with one contrast dose, we can get AP and lateral one simultaneous acquisition. So, if the dose is say 4 to 5 ml contrast, we generally take only one one and we convert that run into a fluoroscopic guidance and use that to get the ophthalmic artery narrowing. So once we are into the ophthalmic artery, we generally inject with one ml syringe, so only one ml is. In the other issue is about the tortuosity. You can see the tortuosity right from the neck. There is a loop. Then, if you look at the course of the artery, this works. So, if you look at this artery, there is a loop over here. Then, as the artery ascends up, goes into the vitreous and this carotid, this S shape configuration makes the navigation of the microcatheter very difficult. And if the microcatheter generally is, is very, very small in compared to the lumen of the artery. So the, here, the, because of the pulsatility, the microcatheter keeps moving and it's difficult 
to come in a reverse direction and navigate the ophthalmic branch. So to avoid this, we can put a coaxial guiding catheter right up to here to in order to suppress all these pulsatility and this navigation difficulties. So this is one uh, example which is shows that the ophthalmic artery is here, but it's a reverse turn like this. This loop, because the microcatheter is very, very small as compared to the lumen, will make it difficult to navigate and have a one-to-one -one navigation with the ophthalmic artery. So we have to take the guiding catheter right up to here. So this will uh, eliminate all those loops and make the catheterization a little more. Now, sometimes the ophthalmic artery can go into spasm. So in that situation, we inject pneumodipine and wait for five. Generally, it opens up and then uh, sometimes the ophthalmic artery uh, is not filling through the internal carotid and then situation we generally take a run from the external carotid. Once we see there is a nerve uh, reconstitution, then we go selectively into the artery and then deliver the drug to the ophthalmic artery. Now, once the procedure is out, we remove first the microcatheter, take a shoot, uh, and to ensure that the uh, major vessels are filling well, there is no vasospasm or severe related complication. Then we remove the guiding catheter, and in the end, we remove the femoral sheath. So we have to achieve the uh, hemostasis in such a way that it doesn't compress sufficiently to uproot the vascular flow. So we keep checking the uh, distal pulsation, in the dorsalis pitis, or sometimes we can also raise the uh, device to measure the SO2. So with this word, I will say that uh, it has been a long journey over the last 10 years when we started off with some DBT grant. And these procedures are very expensive because the microcatheter is very, very small, 1.5 French. One French is equivalent to 0.3 and 0.33 millimeter. So 1.5 is less than the millimeter. So those are specially made and come from abroad. So I think they are very expensive, including the other devices like the micro So I think uh, in the initial things we started with DBT grant, but then we also got this included in the Ayushman Bharat grant as well as two. So the patients who are poor, they can generally get benefit of the Ayushman. So. With this word, I will hand over the mic to Dr. Kauna, Dr. Rachna Bhatti. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, uh, we represent the pediatric oncology team for this entire uh, initiative. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Bhavna, for inviting us. So, part of it has already been covered in the presentation. I think quite a lot has been covered, but for those who have uh, joined late, I think it should be fine. But I think uh, for continuity's sake, I'd like, just like to quickly go over the slides. So, retinoblastoma, as you all know, it's the commonest intraocular. Uh, tumor of children and it's a highly curable tumor. It's one of the most curable tumors and that for that reason the WHO has actually included as it as a priority tumor and one of the six tumors which the WHO has characterized has sort of included in the salvageable tumors. So it's in this global initiative and just for the simple reason that it is a highly highly curable uh, tumor and treatment outcomes are excellent and most of these excellent outcomes are seen in the high income countries where our survival is almost touching 90-95% which is not true for developing countries or the low income countries. So if you all look, everybody is familiar with this mandate or the goals of RB treatment where the focus is vision, globe salvage as well as life. So for the high income countries or the developed countries, their entire focus is on the globe and vision. So these are the focus for the developed countries. But whereas for the developing countries, the LMICs, most of our patients are presenting very late and in advanced stage. And so like for example, in the, for example, extraocular disease, where it is to the tune of 2 to 5% in the developed countries, 
we are seeing almost to the tune of 35, 40 or even 50 percent of our children are presenting late. So that is the contrast that we see between the developed and the developing world. But it is at the same time one needs to realize that it is a highly curable tumor and that is why the reason, uh, the, there is a lot of focus on treating retinoblastoma. So what are the reasons that various studies have shown is that there is lack of awareness, poor compliance to treatment, absence of adequate of course healthcare facilities which may or may not be true for tertiary centers, unwillingness for enucleation but again one needs to realize that what we are talking today of intra-arterial chemotherapy the role of enucleation is really dwindling down. So RV as you have just seen it is classified into intraocular and extraocular disease and again extraocular further we classify into metastatic or non-metastatic disease. So modalities as we all know broadly would be enucleation the most popular modality which was till a few uh, for, uh, till was uh, the most popular modality till uh, sort of maybe a uh, few uh, a while ago but then with chemotherapy, chemotherapy now it's becoming almost indispensable pillar. So for all types of retinoblastoma chemotherapy, chemotherapy is required even today even as we stand today. Radiation again uh, external beam radiotherapy or the proton this is of course widely available and but then again losing its popularity local therapy and of course HSCT for the advanced generally the advanced or the metastatic disease. So if we look we are going to focus only on chemotherapy so what types of chemotherapy would be it could be either intravenous intra arterial that is the focus today again it's a form of target therapy because you are targeting you are just instilling the required drug into the focus where you need to act, where, you, where your tumor is, you are just instilling. Unlike what you are using for systemic chemotherapy, again, intravitreal as well as periocular other modes of, in, of chemotherapy that is used. So, management has, over one decade we have seen a lot of changes in the management of retinoblastoma. As I told you, even the role of enucleation, EBRT is coming down markedly. Even while we are managing our cases, we have seen the requirement of enucleation is really coming down of course EBRT oh. sort of restricted is only to the use in extraocular disease otherwise we are hardly using EBRT for a, a, a retinoblastoma patients. So what if you are moving away from EBRT and then systemic chemotherapy then comes the role of tar target therapy that we are focusing on today. So it's a more selective ocular delivery of drugs so as to increase the exposure of your tumor to the required drug. It maximizes your efficacy and minimizes the side effects. So again, the two commonest modality, popular modalities are the IAC and the intravitreal. But of course, this is more popular and it has gained much uh, popularity and usage is much wider and that has been the focus of today's discussion. So the key outcomes are, so uh, what does, what is the advantage? It decreases the acute toxicity. So we've been talking of systemic chemotherapy the acute myelosuppression, the incidence of abionutropenias, blood component therapy, everything, the entire incidence of acute toxicity of chemotherapy and radiotherapy comes down. Radiation again, susceptibility for the acute, besides the acute complication, you also have the late effects. So late effects again, once you treat them with drugs like etoposide or you use radiation for these children, they are very much prone to second neoplasms, autotoxicity and many more complications growth gets affected, lot of lot of late effects come up once you use these drugs. Then again, then your chances of globe salvage increase markedly once you use a target therapy. Decreased time of treatment is one of your major advantages with your intra-arterial chemotherapy. So it is said that you may even require as little as three settings, sometimes you may require many more, but then even studies have shown three settings are enough to tackle a intraocular disease. So then your time is very very less, you can give it at a frequency of about 3 weeks or so versus if you use intravenous chemotherapy or radiation you know then of course your duration is much much more. Then of course it, the one more other advantage of the other key outcomes are that sometimes it is a refractory disease with group D or, sub, uh, or maybe sometimes with group E also where you have resistant vitriol or subretinal seeding. There again there is a role of intra-arterial chemotherapy. So these are the four or five major key outcomes where your intra-arterial chemotherapy has proved to be beneficial. So then the terminology somebody had mentioned already, so I'll just quickly go through it. So these are, one needs to be familiar once you are using the intra-arterial chemotherapy. So it is either the primary intra-arterial, the first line management. This is the best, this should be the 
most I think opted for if you have group D, particularly group D or maybe some children with group E retinoblastoma, then of course there is an option of secondary IAC where you there is a failure but you've already used the so you've already exposed the children to other modalities which should not be are in current currently in the current era. Then there is this tandem IAC where you're using it for bilateral simultaneously which is not very, it's not very popular and may, it may not be advisable. Again, the question of expertise come in because there are a lot of complications also ascribed or associated with the intra-arterial uh, chemotherapy. So this is not a very popular modality. Then you have this bridge where you are using again IAC and then you may use, you may use uh, intravenous chemotherapy and then you plan to use the intra-arterial in the long run. Then of course rescue when you have used it once, the child is born into remission and you propose to reuse it because the child has responded well. So these are the five basic ty types of intra-arterial chemotherapy that you can use for your patients. Contraindication I am not going into, of course one needs to be aware and when you are planning the checklist needs to be adhered to and then careful patient selection is a must. So contraindications need to be kept in mind, these are very small children, often malnourished. Complications. Again, could be ascribed to procedure or to chemotherapy or a, could be a combination of both. So, may be discussed, but what are important is that you do have as simple as a hematoma or systemic thromboembolic episodes can occur. You can have events like stroke or even limb ischemia. Allergy to dyes may occur and a seizure related complications as have been pointed out. The chemotherapy complications I like to emphasize. So, it is not foolproof that you will not have neutropenia after IAC some amount of absorption does occur. So that is the reason that you will have some amount of neutropenia. That is the reason that these children do need to be followed for your terms after the procedure. There could be lid edema, ephroptosis, temporary loss of eyelashes, forehead hyperemia as you can see, along the supraorbital artery, ptosis and focal madurosis and as you can see there is some loss of hair, the ephroptosis then the hyperemia. Then the ocular complications are important. The spasm of the ophthalmic artery, occlusion, central retinal artery occlusion have already been discussed. What I want to again emphasize is retinal detachment again, which the pediatric oncologist again are worried of because again your vision gets compromised. So this is in studies, some studies have shown it to be as high as 25%. So with this, I invite Dr. Shivam to cover the uh, drugs that would be, of course, they've been already mentioned. So they are, so he'll be discussing the three drugs, the doses, the uh, schedule that we follow for these uh, patients. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. So here I will be discussing about the chemotherapeutic drugs which we are using in IAC. And more important, uh, more importantly, I will be discussing about the evidence which we have. So why IAC? What are we gaining? And with regards to the global evidence and the recent trial which has come. So important to know with melphalan which has been, now the in vitro study which was done, uh, I think it was uh, re uh, it was already discussed, but in the 1984s so of the first in vitro studies which used melphalan and its effectiveness on, an, on a mouse model for retinoblastoma cells. And then by the, by the end of the 19, uh, by the end of the 20th century, then people came up with the concept of IAC and melphalan was the first drug to be used. But myelosuppression was quite, quite popular at that time with, with melphalan, even with an IAC approach. Then people had come up by the, by the uh, year of 2004 and 2006 with the super selective uh, aspect of the IAC with which the myelosuppression rates did fall down. Now, melphalan was the first drug and at a dose of 0.5 mg per kg, but the capping is done at 7.5 mg. So none of the studies, uh, they have used melphalan beyond 7.5 mg, most popularly being used at 5 mg, 5 mg as the absolute dose of melphalan. About the topotican, so the benefit of topotican which was found was more for the seeds, for the diffuse seeds, so the group, group C, even group D having focal and diffuse seeds, the activity of topotican was directed towards them and absolute dose of 1 mg was used. Initially, before its use in the IAC, topotican was first utilized in the periocular uh, therapy and there the results were promising and due to which uh, um, uh, 2006 was the uh, year when it was used as a part of the triple drug regimen, which, uh, which we call melphalan, topotican and carboplan. 
Now carboplatin was then popularized by Abramson et al. So this was in 2006 where they published their data and as a part of the triple drug. Now here also there is there is a range of doses which is used from 15 mg to 30 mg but the most commonly used across the series is 20 mg as, as the absolute dose. Talking about the evidence, now if we, if we take BMC cancer, this paper which was published in 2018, this was a meta-analysis and uh, mind you by this time we did not have a RCT, there was no head-to-head -head randomized control trial. This data was, the analysis was done for the retrospective case series or the case reports. So th these were only cohort and they were analyzed and data was extracted out of them. Now, this included 26 studies, we are, out of which 11, what, 11 included IAC and 15 are included on the intravenous aspects. The globe salvage rate, as you can see, was having a superior significant, uh, statistically significant difference was there in group B, group D only. So it was almost like 80% for the IAC versus for the IVC it was 55%. So here there was a statistically significant difference. But this could not be translated to the group E IVC. Now with regards, if we try to analyze the data more into, more into the depths, why is there no benefit with in group B or uh, group B IVs? Now the entire concept of systemic chemotherapy is a little flawed in group B. You would more want to go with the focal therapy rather than going for the systemic therapy or even a focal chemotherapeutic agent because the group B IVs, group A as well as group B IVs can be effectively treated with focal therapies and not by the use of chemotherapies. That is the reason the number of studies which would concentrate on group B were very less. That's why we could not establish any statistically significant difference. Which is So this shows that the group B is the best I in which you should go ahead with the primary eyes. Also important to note is there was no statistically significant difference in the recurrence and the metastatic rates between the IEC and the IVC. And recurrence by mean if you, if you need a rescue IECs or uh, a secondary approach that will be less as compared to the uh, in both the apps. And lastly, this is the evidence which was published in uh, July uh, 31st this year, which was the first RCT for a head-to-head -head trial between the IAC and the IVC. So the intravenous versus the super-selected intra-arterial chemotherapy. So this was the trial which was an open-label trial, a multi-center across six hospitals in China. So the Chinese trial. And it included unilateral group D and group E IVs. So all unilateral disease, the, the first indication to be used as the primary approach. Now what they did was one is to one randomization and they randomized to triple drug versus IVC. So the triple drug approach including uh, the topotecan, carbo, uh, carboplatin and melphalan at the doses which I described earlier. And then there were three cycles, within three cycles which were used and this they compared with the IVC, the intravenous which was the standard dose CV, the carbo, etopo and the vincristin. Now what was the results, what were the results of the data? So there were 143 patients who were randomized, 72 to the IAC arm and 71 to the IVC and the median age was 2 years. The 2 year progression fee, so they did not only talk about the globe sandwich, they also talked about the progression free sandwich progression-free globe salvage. So what was the event in this case? The event was any progression on examination under anesthesia or the need to enucleate. If you need to enucleate the eye or if there is any new active lesion or progression in the seeds, that in itself is an event. So they wanted to, diff they wanted to assess the difference in the both the IAC and the IVC thing and they found for the group D, group E IVs, it was 53% in IAC versus 27%. And this was statistically significant. The relative risk 1.97 beyond uh, 1. And this was at a follow-up of 36 months. The myelosuppression, again, it is not a foolproof technique as Nam was saying. It occurred in 50%, almost 50% individuals did have some amount of myelosuppression. But yes, it was statistically significant, different from what you would get after IVC. It was lower. 
if you would go with only intravenous approach. And in IAC again, there were two cases who had ophthalmic artery occlusion and there were 13 patients, so which comes out to be 18 percent who had ophthalmic artery stenosis. So this was an important data which we get uh, 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 from this. Now for the SWOT analysis, I would uh, like to invite Ma'am to uh, give the final comments. Just go quickly, I think we are running short of time. So with this, uh, uh, what we feel that IC actually has emerged, also has emerged as a promising option for eye salvage, particularly the advanced retinoblastoma, which more so is true for the primary uh, uh, primary uh, salvage uh, the set for secondary management. So one thing that we came across interesting was this SWOT analysis which was done by Dr. Honawa in 2019 which still stays valid. So just looking into the strengths of ISE as a procedure, it's a localized treatment, negligible systemic toxicity, improved eye salvage in advanced intraocular retinoplastoma and less rate of new tumor development and also reduced treatment duration. The weaknesses included lack of systemic chemoprotective effect, irreversible vision threatening complications, again very worrisome for the pediatrician, it's a long learning curve, I think we are still in the learning curve, expensive technique, again a major limitation for our patients. We often have to forego, whenever there is a visible need for ISC also, we have to forego the procedure because for want of finances, again as Shivam pointed out, lack of prospective RCTs. But I think in times to come, it is definitely a very popular, very useful technique and RCTs are going to emerge once I think finances become more easily available. Opportunities are plenty, again a cost effective technique, we should have standardized protocols, again collaboration with a lot of centers. The low and middle income countries also should start using and then a uniform protocol, reporting of adverse effects and having a registry I think will help all of us. The threats are equally important, again and again I am seeing the all pediatricians first, so this bothers us. There is, there is a chance of failure to identify the clinically high risk features. Again there would, could be a, just a parent demand to preserve the unsalvageable eyes, emerging less equipped, low volume, maybe all centers are just venturing into treating patients with ISC and intervention specialists need to be aware of the ocular consequences. So I think with this, we would like to say again that risk and benefits have to be weighed before we choose this technique for a, for a child. And, but of course, definitely, it's a very, very useful and upcoming technique. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rachna, for giving us all those insights, uh, particularly from the pediatric point of view. Very relevant and uh, you've always given us a lot of support. And we are really grateful for that. So before I wind up, just a little bit, I will share uh, the uh, the work that has been done at AIMS and the data that we have at our center as far as IAC is concerned and our, what our own experience has been. So uh, many times this has been discussed and I'll just skip through this slide that the goals of uh, therapy of retinoblastoma, everyone knows what they are. And we also know now with all these talks that, you know, there has been a paradigm shift towards globe salvage treatments in retinoblastoma. And that is why super selective IAC has come here to stay. Now, this is the first paper that described the four-year experience of IAC for the management of retinoblastoma pioneered by Gobin and Abramson uh, at New York. And this actually set the tone for IAC worldwide. So the challenge in our own institute was of course building this team uh, working together. We have three specialities uh, working together to, uh, to do this work, ophthalmology, interventional neuroradiology and pediatric oncology. And as has been discussed before many times, careful case selection is very important and of course building a multidisciplinary team that works together. So our own experience of IAC over the de decade, what it has been uh, like, I will just go through over the next few slides. So last 10 years, you must be wondering how many IACs we have done and how many globes we have salvaged. So here is the data. There were 22 patients, 85 eyes, which means that in three cases, it was a bilateral procedure. 170 procedures were undertaken. Of these, 161 procedures were successfully accomplished and the remaining nine had to be abandoned. 
uh, due to certain procedural complications like inability to catheterize or intraoperative ophthalmic artery spasm, which is again very much reported in the literature as well. The mean age of patients was 4 years, the range was 1 to 10 years. And if you look at this graph over a period of 10 years, you know, when we started IEC was somewhere between 2013 and 14. And you see that initially we did a lot of uh, cases. And can anyone say what was the reason for that? Um, any guesses? So uh, when we initially started, so one reason was that we had the funds. So we were supported by the D, one of our DST projects. We had funds for IC and it was very expensive procuring all these uh, the stuff. And that is why we were able to do a lot of cases. And once, you know, the funds started uh, getting depleted, we had like fewer cases and then, you know, COVID struck. And because of COVID, there was again, you know, a sort of a slow phase. And then again, now we have picked up and, you know, over the last two years, we have been doing again a lot of IEC. And like Professor Gaikwad sir mentioned that, you know, now many of these patients are being covered under Ayushman. And we have a very active, uh, you know, uh, social worker who, you know, sort of takes care of the finances and everything of these patients. And that is why now we have picked up uh, the number of our IEC cases at AIMS. So if you look at the group-wise distribution of these eyes that I mentioned, uh, you know, the maximum number of uh, um, eyes were, um, which were found to be eligible for the procedure were group D eyes, as has been mentioned, 66%, followed by group E eyes, and again, lowest was group B and C. And anybody why B and C are the fewest in numbers here that were subjected to the IEC procedure? because they respond very well to intravenous chemotherapy and that has been the standard treatment so far so that is why there are very few cases that you know are being um, uh, are being uh, advised intraarterial chemotherapy in the bnc category and most of them are group d but what is heartening to see here is that like as dr rashna mentioned till few years ago we were enucleating all group eyes at the outset now that is no longer the case many of these group eyes are also being treated with globe salvage treatments. One of them is IAC and we are getting good results. Now, if you look at the number of sessions per INR data, so this compares with most of the studies worldwide standard, like the minimum number of sessions that have, of course, been, have been one, and the maximum that we have gone up to in our setting has been four, and two is the most common number of sessions that, you know, um, have been administered per I. Uh, with IAC and here are the drugs so we use a combination it's been the drugs have been nicely described in the previous talk but all I'm going to mention here is that in our data what we found is that single drug melphalan was the most commonly used and then followed by three drug combination melphalan, topotecan and carboplatin and then least of all was the double drug regimen that was used in our patients. Again, type of IEC, many types of IEC have been described if you look at the terminology, but we have basically subgrouped them into primary and secondary IEC. And here you can see that the bulk of our patients were treated by secondary IEC, which means they were all refractory cases. They had failed intravenous chemotherapy and other forms of treatment, and that is why they were advised IEC. Now we have just of late we have started using IEC even as a primary treatment, but then there are a lot of constraints, and one of them is funding the other is getting a immediate date for IEC because there's a work, whole lot of workload in the neuroradiology department so sometimes you know it, they don't get immediate dates for primary treatment and that is where we think that we can send them for systemic chemotherapy at least the treatment can start now this is again a slide showing um, our globe salvage because this is the question that would come to everybody's mind how many eyes are we saving through IEC so well overall we've had a globe salvage rate of 80 percent which is per quite respectable I would say 68 of those eyes that we have treated um, after IAC was saved and when we say saved means that our definition for failure is an enucleation post IAC. So 20% of the eyes had to undergo enucleation after the procedure at some stage. And again, if you look at the globe salvage rates, B and C have a 100% globe salvage rate at our center. Again, that is expected because the tumor is not that advanced. And as the tumor advances, the globe salvage rate expectedly becomes lower and lower. But the good thing is that we've also saved about 41% of the group E, which are really advanced eyes with IAC. So this is a chart showing additional treatment like apart from IEC we also have intravitreal and periocular treatments given locally. So these are the number of cases that receive additional treatments uh, in addition to IEC in order to achieve globe salvage. 
This is some illustrative cases. So this is a case done very long ago in 2014. So initially we used to do IAC for like one-eyed patients you know, with bilateral retinoblastoma. One eye was already enucleated and we were really desperate to save that eye. So this was one such case, very large tumor at the posterior pole and they were all refractory to systemic chemotherapy. Normally such tumors do respond to systemic chemotherapy but this was one such refractory case and this was after two cycles of IAC where the tumor regressed. This is again, so these are all red cam images, they are images of the retina for those of you who are not familiar with these kind of images. This is again another tumor like that, you can see such a big tumor, you can barely see the optic disc and after um, successful IC the disc is visible and this tumor has shrunk in, into a calcified mass. So these were the world, very early cases in 2014 when we had just started. This was another one. Here you can see, you know, systemic multifocal tumors, one, two, and three. Systemic chemotherapy worked for these two tumors, but didn't work for this one. You can still see the residual mass here, but IAC worked for this particular tumor. So it doesn't have to be the one tumor in that eye. There can be multiple tumors. Some may respond to intravenous, and there may be still be some tumors that, you know, are still active. This is a, a, of a recent patient. Group D retinoblastoma, this is how the red cam picture looked like when the patient came. This was after six cycles of intravenous chemotherapy. This part of the tumor is showing calcification, but this is still showing active disease and this is after two cycles of IAC. This is all basically a mixed pattern regression, which we identify like a calcification and a fish flesh appearance in some areas of uh, chororetinal atrophy. Again, another patient. Uh, this is particularly important because I want to show this was a primary IAC case, meaning thereby that the child had not received any intravenous chemotherapy before. At the outset, was taken up for a primary IAC group D initially, and this is how the patient responded after one cycle. This is after two cycles, and the patient has been stable. So complications have been talked about, I'll just talk about one patient here that we saw at Ames. This is like all the complications that have been enumerated. We encountered one of these cases as a third nerve palsy. Again, this was a child that was where the IC was done many years ago in 2015. This was a post-procedure, day seven, child had third nerve palsy, but after three weeks, it spontaneously resolved. Now look at this, our data compared to real world outcomes. So these are some of the studies of IC that have been published. And uh, overall, if you see that the outcomes that people have reported seem to be better in cases where that were treated with primary IAC rather than secondary IAC, uh, but uh, we don't have much experience yet of primary, but overall our outcome has been, globe salvage rate has been around 80%, which is comparable to some of the other centers in the world. So before I end, I would like to acknowledge all the teams that we are working uh, with as well as our own team at RP Center, our Chief Professor Tityal, our unit in charge, Professor Radhika, the faculty of Ocular Oncology, our senior residents, and the team from Intervention Neuroradiology, Pediatric Ocular Oncology team, Professor Gaikwad, Professor Rachna, Dr. Lomi, the statistician, Dr. Shivam Pandey, who has done all these statistics for us, and our MSSO, who has been working very hard for these patients, also deserves a word of praise. And I would now like to invite Matt to just conclude the rounds. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bhavna, Dr. Gaipa, Dr. Rachna, and everyone for having put the CGR together. Uh, it's really been a big journey, and the whole team is involved, and we've now had a chance to see Get a, get a chance to meet members of your team as well. Uh, it's um, everybody is a very has a very busy back schedule, and unfortunately, one doesn't get a chance to interact one to one. So, in that sense, I think uh, the CGR was good, and one mustn't forget the ocular pathology department. Dr. Seema Sen is here because uh, they also play a huge role. And there's so many people involved that it's really difficult to. Um, you know, stay, uh, involve everybody in this one hour. But I would say that uh, I myself uh, have noticed that um, uh, people who hesitate to do the oncology posting, whereas now many of the residents, they actually ask for the posting. So that's been, and you know, here and there you do get the feedback that things have changed. Um, and uh, even faculty who uh, were not involved in this field at all, Dr. Gomi, I would like to acknowledge, uh, he stepped up and he um, helped a lot in the hand-holding in the intervening period uh, to, uh, you know, um, 
bridge the gap and you know letting the services continue dr bhavna of course has worked so hard over years and um, uh, it's really creditable to see the entire uh, achievements that have been uh, uh, attained with knowing the difficulties we face dr gaikwad is you know sitting there very quietly but we know that how difficult it is and they have so many pressures in their department as well and the anesthet is the as another big huge team uh, which helps so in a, in summary i would say that uh, it's really creditable that our the results and uh, the sort of data is uh, proving that this is a treatment we may uh, aims is still there along with the best in the world and um, i would say that you know congratulations to everybody and all the speakers they covered the topic so nicely uh, thank you very much